Janina as a Master of Architecture from St. Lucas in Brussels. Uh, and then after that obtained a Master in Human Settlements uh, and a PhD in the History and Theory of Architecture at the University of Leuven in Belgium. And uh, she's a lecturer in the History and Theory of Architecture at the University of Hassel for a while and conduct postdoctoral research projects at the University of Queensland in Australia and at TU Delft in the Netherlands. And she's currently also co-editor of the book series Bloomsbury Studies in Architecture together with Thomas Abermann. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, I'm at ETH Zurich. That's not yeah. in the, in the bio. The, at the moment, yes. <laughs> at the moment, yes. OK, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I would like to start by introducing you to NEO um, in the words of those behind the project. NEO is the construction of a new district on a historical site near the Atomium. NEO is an ambitious and visionary reurbanization based on the sustainable development of a multitude of different urban facilities and functions. NEO is a center of human, economic, commercial, touristic, cultural, leisure and home development, creating 5,000 new jobs in the long term. NEO is a development opportunity for the whole country. NEO Brussels is a capital project in the heart of Europe that will attract 15 million visitors per year. Now, this statement introducing this new 18 hectare urban development project on a, on a legacy site on the outskirts of Brussels, Belgium, where in 1958 the World Fair was held, is accompanied by a two minute video which unapologetically draws on sev several of the cliche tropes that have by now become ubiquitous signifiers of this type of large, commercially driven urban development. Expertly drawing on the brand of Brussels as a capital of Europe to market a new development, the video starts with images of the Big Ben, the Brandenburg Gate and the Eiffel Tower to then show the Atomium site in Brussels, which is where the project will be located. The spirited tune reaches a climax as we gloss over the proposed new site. After several bird's eye views, we are taking on a close-up <coughs> tour of the different areas of the project through a sequence of panning zooms which emphasize fluid motion over stasis or flow over friction. White, glazed and mostly nondescript blocks of architecture are shown bathing in a sea of green. This architecture is not about signs or meaning, it is not to be read or decoded, but to be immediately experienced to smell, to hear, to see, to taste. The video then goes on to highlight some of the many recreational attractions that will be incorporated in the new development, such as the Spiruland indoor theme park and also the Cité des Enfants or Children's City, which you will see in a moment. Now, destined to include 21 new film theatres, the word cinema is also prominently present. Then a series of clips from existing shopping centres are, are shown to confirm that global brands such as Apple, Nespresso, Forever 21 and Sephora will find a place in the new Mall of Europe as well. These clips aim to depict the Mall as a place for human interaction rather than a site for individualist consumption. Finally, a sequence of hero shots of the entire project with the Belgian flag flapping atop the Atomium concludes the video as texts touting the development as a new landscape district and a residential area for everyone, which has attracted over 800 million euros in private investment appears on the screen. The Mall of Europe, we are told, will open in 2021 and is proudly financed by Unibel Rodamco, CFE and Basics. Now, watching this video, it is quite easy to pinpoint NEO as a poster child of neoliberal development. The project's promotional footage underlines the growing importance of big business, commerce and global brands on our built environment. Another element that confirms its allegiance to neoliberal development is the fact that NEO is not solely driven by private interests, but relies on a substantial contribution from the public purse. Apart from Unibel, Rodamco and Co, the city of Brussels and the Brussels capital region are injecting more than 300 million euros into this project. So NEO is basically a public-private <coughs> partnership or PPP. And PPPs popularized at the end of the Cold War when two concurrent trends emerged. On the one hand, there was growing support for government enablement of markets. And on the other hand, there were calls for greater government enablement of communities. 
At the same time, a third trend popularized, which supported the marriage of these two opposing camps on the grounds that partnerships between communities and the private <coughs> sector, mediated by the public sector, would achieve a synergy, able to overcome the shortcomings of each of the other two trends. This third way thus both favored growth, entrepreneurship, enterprise and wealth creation, as well as greater social justice, and allowed a major role to the public sector in bringing this about. As a result, in this period following the end of the Cold War, public-private partnerships became a preferred tool for urban development. Now, recent scholarship has been rather negative vis-a-vis -vis public private partnerships, calling them the Trojan horse of neoliberal urban development. It suggests that while in theory, PPPs support power sharing between the private sector and local governments, once the process is in motion, the interests of the community are often overwhelmed by those of the private sector. As such, public private partnerships are said to enunciate rather than mitigate the sharp edges of neoliberal <coughs> capitalism. Now, what I'd like to do in this presentation is to examine a bit of the prehistory of public-private partnerships in Belgium by chronicling some of the history of NEO. I will basically very, very briefly show two other Belgian projects that are precedents of this type of urban development. And the first such example can be found in 1960s Genk, which is a city in the northeast end of the country that had a very nebulous urban growth in the first half of the 20th century as a result of the mining industry um, in the region. In the 1960s then, when mining began to decline, Genk set out to reinvent itself and adopted a plan to construct a large new urban development, that's the, the yellow blob, adjacent to its historical uh, CBD, uh, which by then had lost its center function. This new development included a large shopping centre as well as several other communal facilities and was initiated by the city council. They selected the site, they expropriated the land and they also commissioned an architect of their choice to develop a design. In 1964, architect Plumier presented his first plans, a complex of detached rectilinear buildings with different height, size and function, all located in a car-free area um, completely pedestrianized and surrounded by uh, parking lots. Uh, it incorporated a large housing block, offices, offices, an administrative center, a hotel, a cafe, a restaurant, a range of communal facilities such as a daycare center and swimming pool, but also a significant proportion of shops. The buildings were all connected through an intricate system of streets in the sky, which separated vehicular traffic from pedestrians, while providing a place where people could linger, chat and observe activities sort of in the lower lying areas. However, by 1965, after a first review, Plumier's design had evolved from this initial multi-level, multi-functional open air complex to an elongated single story open air street, which traversed the plot from east to west. The main function of this uh, complex was commerce, but it did still include a limited set of auxiliary functions. At its most western point, it gathered um, two large supermarkets, so that is here, and a few smaller commercial units around a spacious square, while in the east end, here, it had a health clinic, a restaurant and a hotel around a square with a pond. Based on this design, the municipality opened a tendering procedure and soon reached an agreement with Construction et Entreprise Industrielle. Genk would sell the land that it had expropriated to this private company, which in exchange would build the project following the design of Plumier. However, in the contract that Construction et Entreprise Industrielle sent to the municipality in May 1965, the company suggested that the established price, 25, 25 million Belgian francs, was still negotiable. They wrote, should Genk, the municipality, refrain from, ob from obliging the company to construct certain of the non-profitable components, then the conditions of the sale could still be revised, taking into account the additional available land and the surplus value that could be attributed to it. Now, as a result of this letter, Genk basically budged. Throughout 1966 and 1967, Plumier's plans changed dramatically. Generous concessions were made to the private partner and when the envisaged grand urban development project finally opened its doors in August 1968, it no longer remotely resembled the initial plans. What was built instead was Belgium's first fully enclosed climate controlled shopping centre that was proudly named Shopping One. <laughs> 
A similar story unfolded in the Brussels periphery where an ambitious urban development project was launched in the late 1960s. <coughs> Around the time that this project was initiated, the population of Brussels was increasing rapidly and with the construction of the new ring road around the city, its urban fabric started spreading. So when in 1963, De Vimo, a real estate company, took the initiative to construct what they called a luxury shopping center in Woluwe, which is one of the 19 municipalities that make up the Brussels capital region, the local municipal council quickly capitalized on this opportunity to create a large urbanization plan, which would make Woluwe a major subcentrality of the Brussels capital region. Master plan was prepared, which proposed to combine the shopping center, which is in black here, uh, with cultural and leisure, leisure facilities, and those are the uh, light, gr uh, light gray entities, as well as several multi-story residential units, and those are in this plan in, oops, in dark gray, like there. Pedestrian walkways, such as this promenoire central, which traversed the shopping center, were to connect the various areas of the development. However, the proposed master plan was never officially adopted by the municipality and therefore never realized. In subsequent versions of the design, the pedestrian walkways disappeared and this open air promenoir central evolved into a more common enclosed air conditioned mall. This evolution coincided with the arrival of Sears, Roebuck and Company as the Vimo's financial investors for the project. As a result, when Woluwe Shopping Center opened in September 1968, none of the other amenities that were to surround it had been built, and this would remain so for several decades to come. So these two brief examples give some hints as to why public-private partnerships have accrued a bad reputation. In both cases, little more than a shopping center was realized of the ambitious mixed-use urban schemes that were initially proposed. Now, reasons for this breakdown varied. In the case of Yenk, the public actor yielded to the interest of the private sector, who quite unsurprisingly sought to get a better deal. Um, likewise, in Woluwe, most of the blame could be assigned to the municipal administration, who failed to formally approve the proposed urban master plan. But what these examples also show is that the history of public-private partnerships dates back further than the end of the Cold War. In Belgium, as elsewhere in Europe, public-private partnerships underwriting such large urban development schemes already emerged in the mid-20th century. After the atrocities of the Second World War, European governments had become quite suspicious of the threat that all too extreme and nationalist expressions of citizenship posed. The question how a new modern post-war society could be shaped, which, which shared common pursuits, but which was simultaneously devoid of totalitarian overtones, became paramount in many European welfare states. In response to this question, the ideal of the consumer citizen emerged, who was believed to be both independent and community-minded. Many planners and architects believed that a new community of consumer citizens could be shaped through mixed-use urban developments that blended commercial functions with civic, administrative and leisurely pursuits. The evolving thinking regarding the concept of the consumer citizen from the mid to the late 20th century uh, also to a certain extent clarifies evolving approaches to liberalism and the evolution from a welfare state to a neoliberal regime. In the second half of the 20th century, claims by leftist writers such as Theodor Adorno and Max Horkheimer, who suggested that consumption was a tool of mass deception wielded by capitalists consolidating their reins, were increasingly challenged by those on the right, who suggested that markets could regulate themselves and that consumers actually enjoyed greater freedom than so-called oppressed citizens. So when in the early 1970s, the Club of Rome published their influential book, The Limits to Growth, and the economic crisis hit, the foundations of the European welfare state regime, which had been instrumental in harness, harnessing capitalism's consumption juggernaut, began to shake and crumbled when figures such as Reagan and Thatcher advocated that the market offered greater freedom and that consumers were better able to know and define their own needs and to pursue these rationally. Now, what does this all mean for NEO? The first phase that is currently being built of this ambitious project is Europea, which is marked in pink in this drawing. Apart from approximately 500 housing units, this 
phase, this first phase, like the first phases that were constructed of the schemes that were proposed for Yank and Volua, consists by and large of commerce. The so-called Mall of Europe will comprise about 70,000 square meters of shops, as well as 9,000 square meters of restaurants and associated hospitality functions. When you compare what is being constructed in phase one, so the pink, with the public and community, uh, communal amenities that currently exist on site, which were mostly erected in the latter half of the 20th century, it quickly becomes clear that in this first phase, very few of the advertised public spaces are realized. And just for clarification, these are existing uh, buildings. These are all existing complexes. And basically, these are just retained. Um, only this one is demolished, so there's no new spaces built. So uh, at the moment, developers are basically reaping what the welfare state uh, sowed, these buildings that already existed. Furthermore, when you have a closer look at the advertised public spaces that are proposed for NEO, it soon becomes clear that these are largely subservient to the commercial pursuits of the scheme. They, for instance, facilitate the vehicular connection from the A12 motorway to the site. They provide a green link for pedestrians from the car park to the shops, and they reshape the avenues to make the shops better accessible and to make shopping more pleasant still. But perhaps none of this even matters, as the illustrations of these public spaces that are featured on the website of NEO are, as explicitly stated in this blue box, nothing more than artists' impressions which are not legally binding. <laughs> so perhaps the Trojan horse of neoliberal urban development is not so much the public-private partnership itself as the public partner in this partnership, who rather than define, defending the interests of communities, all too gladly sells the prerogative to shape contemporary citizenship to the highest bidder. And if you permit me a short epilogue, when in 2006, J.G. Ballard wrote Kingdom Come, which was set in a shopping center, it was described as a novel about a dystopian future. The shopping center is everywhere. Now, with every new public-private partnership-driven urban development that is launched these days, this dystopian future is rapidly becoming our new reality. So to conclude with the words of Ballard himself, the churches are empty and the monarchy shipwrecked itself on its own vanity. Politics is a racket and democracy is just another utility, like gas and electricity. Almost no one has any civic feeling. Consumerism is the one thing that gives us our sense of values. Consumerism is honest and teaches us that everything good has a barcode. The great dream of the Enlightenment, that reason and rational self-interest one day triumph, led directly to today's consumerism. Thank you. So I will, I will.